Um, so welcome everybody. Thanks for joining. All right. So then my next question is for you guys, who knows what the difference is between a bank and a credit union? Throw that in the chat if you know. So a lot of times people say, what is a credit union? Um, so a credit union is a not-for-profit organization and our members are actually our shareholders. So instead of having shareholders who are paid dividends um, and vote, our members are those, are those voters. They're the ones who um, really earn the dividends and we reinvest in them. Um, all of our decisions are local and we do have a volunteer board of community leaders and experts. So if you've got any other questions about credit unions, just let us know. A lot of times people are saying, I don't know, what does a credit union do? It's really a full service financial institution. It's just not for profit um, and member owned. So it's interesting because every year I do this presentation and this is the first year that our environment has changed more drastically than it has in the past. So I expect that the questions that come today are different and more tailored to what's happening right now. So throw questions that you might have in the chat for these changing things. So a couple of things that um, Annie and I talked a little bit about that maybe are a top of mind for you all as your um, interns or as you're continuing on your educational journey. What happens if the job market changes and it looks different than how it does today? Um, what if you need to move home? What if you need to stay home? Um, this is a great opportunity now to maybe have a conversation with your parents or folks who are supporting you and say, hey, are, you know, I kind of expected this. I expected really to be able to come home or have a little bit of um, support from you all if, uh, you know, after graduation or during the summers. Is that something that you're still able to do financially? Because the pandemic and COVID has really impacted everyone in a different way. And this is a great opportunity to open that conversation up and say, hey, I just want to, I just want to make sure that I'm thinking correctly about this. It just provides a little bit more peace of mind and clarity. Has anyone been thinking about that at all? Um, and I really think that um, for those folks who are supporting you or your families, it, I would love to hear um, someone who I was supporting or really engaged in their future in education come and ask, hey, are, is this, this is what I'm thinking, is it still gonna work? Um, and just opening up that conversation. So you all are working primarily in, I'm guessing, data fields, tech fields, research fields. Most of the decisions that you make are database decisions, right? Give me a thumbs up if that's true. <laughs> so I would say that your um, financial life is very similar. You're going to use data to drive your decisions. And the um, questions that you really need to start asking yourself is, where does my money go? How can I develop my personal spending plan and be prepared um, in an uncertain economy? How do I manage my credit score so that I can save the most money if I'm going to borrow um, or get the best rates on things like possibly rent or insurance, those types of things. And um, then also we'll talk about how you can contact me if you have additional questions later on. Again, make sure you're popping your questions here in the chat. So first we'll talk about where your money goes. So typically most people are spending money on housing, food, transportation, clothing, entertainment, um, and debt payments. The things that have probably changed the most recently in um, our current economic environment are the transportation costs and um, building an emergency fund. Folks are focused more on savings accounts than they were before and are intentionally building savings into their budget, whereas maybe they thought, oh, it's okay, I, you know, it's not a problem. But um, with the unknown um, economic environment, it's a good idea to kind of include that. Also transportation, that's changed, right? Um, has anyone, uh, anyone who has a car, have you checked your mileage lately to see how many miles you're putting on a car? Or, you know, even ask your parents if they're still putting the same amount of mileage. 
I noticed that I put 20% um, of the mileage that I would typically do this year on my car. So typically I would drive um, 10 to 12,000 miles a year. And this year I've driven less than 2000 miles. I mean, that's, that's pretty significant. And that results in a pretty big change in what your gas uh, expense would be and then also insurance or parking. So keep those things in mind um, and make sure that when you're budgeting those are appropriate. Entertainment, what are you guys doing for entertainment these days? We used to say, hey, uh, you know, we're gonna go out and hang out with friends, we're going to a bar, you know, maybe we're going shopping somewhere. So where is your money going for entertainment these days? Curious to hear. I don't know about everyone else, but I've been picking up quarantine hobbies. So buying plants and stuff um, and just like random hobby stuff. So snacks, saving so much money, <laughs> virtual. Yeah. Board games, Netflix. So, so this is different, right? But it's also important that um, in a time of um, the, you know, in the environment that we're in right now, our type of entertainment is so much different than what it may have been before. And we probably need to budget for these things. We don't probably need to. We need to budget for these things so that we have an outlet um, and we're not wondering where the money went and we're not running out of money at the end of the month or before the next payday or um, dipping into our savings too much. But entertainment is important. Have you heard, have you guys heard the term? Um, I think it, I think it's like pandemic burnout or, or something. I just, I just saw it today, but really kind of getting tired of being restricted and finding new outlets for our energy and fun things that we enjoy. Let's just make sure that we're budgeting for that because it's, it's good for, um, it's good for ourselves um, to make sure that we're finding those outlets. Also, um, just debt payments. If you have credit cards, make sure that you're continuing to pay those things on time um, and then setting aside money for student loan payments. I, um, I like the idea if you're saving money right now um, on things that you would normally spend those things on, spend that money on, think about dumping that into, um, a, in, into an emergency fund. So start building that now because those expenses might come back. For a lot of people, they've been able to spend less money on, on personal items like um, hair and nails or um, some folks who've got children, childcare expense when it wasn't open, um, eating out. So dump that money into a savings account so that it's there and you have a cushion and you're being very intentional about it each month. So when you're building your budget, build those things in that you would have spent pre-pandemic and, and reallocate those into an emergency fund. All right. So the other thing that happens is if we're not tracking our spending, we also start to overspend and we make impulse decisions. So I am really bad because Amazon always suggests so many things that I need. So if I logged on to Amazon um, to buy dog food, I'm probably adding two or three other things to my cart. Who else does that? I, kind, I liken it to the checkout line at the grocery store or um, you know, at Target when you know, before um, we had all moved online and you're grabbing that extra pack of gum or that bottle of water or, um, you know, the bag of candy or, you know, whatever it might be for my kids. It's a pack of Pokemon cards. Um, so then you're doing the impulse pop, um, sh impulse buying. Um, Cherish, I love the small businesses. I have been trying to do that too. Um, I'll plug one of my favorite local small businesses here in a, in a moment. Um, but when you're shopping, think about, do I really need it? Do I have to have it today? Um, what will happen if I don't buy it now? And why have I gotten along uh, without it until now? Um, when I'm shopping small, I'm really bad. I also love plants and um, plant mode is one of my favorite local plant shops. 
And I will tell you, I will go in for one type of plant and I will probably walk out with at least three others. Um, but that wasn't my plan. So I really, I really need to get better about the impulse buying. I'm not sure if anybody else is in that boat. So the reason we budget is really all about providing some stability and um, it builds discipline and organization. And it also means that there's no unanswered questions at the end of the month wondering where the money went. The discipline and organization in, in creating a budget is great. There are so many online budget tools. If you find, found one that you love, um, comment below in the chat and share it with the group. I love an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, so it's, it's one of my things that I like to do. I pull it up at least weekly and just take a look and remind myself where I've spent my money, where I'm planning to spend my money because things do come up throughout the week. Um, in my case, my husband told me yesterday that we need new breaks and that was not in my budget for this month. So I've had to kind of reconfigure and figure out where things are going to go or um, I'm trying to think of something you guys might, might impact you. I also sort of forgot about school registration fees. So while it's not um, necessarily significant in the scheme of the year, it just wasn't built into my budget for last week, as an example. Um, but it really makes you think about your money and um, it, it really prevents crisis. So in knowing like the car repair, in my case, I was able to reallocate something so that it was not an issue. But if I hadn't been able to do that because I didn't know where um, the money was going, it would have been, it could have been a crisis for us, depending on how bad we needed the breaks. Um, you know, knowledge is power, right? When you know where your money is going, then you get to really make decisions. You can make sure that you're able to plan and build an emergency fund and know that you have um, sufficient cash flow to support um, your daily expenses, your monthly expenses, and any upcoming expenses. Um, it also is a stress reliever because you know your exact financial situation. It will, li it will lift a tremendous amount of stress off your shoulders because you don't have to worry about the unknown. The first time that you create your budget, it could be a little bit stressful, um, wondering what it's going to look like. But once you know exactly where you are, each month, it really gives you more control and power um, over that personal situation. So when you're building your budget, you want to start with necessities. Those would be um, kind of what we would refer to as your four walls. Your housing, so if you have rent, um, and housing also includes really utilities, like phone bill and things like that. Um, maybe it, for most people now it's internet instead of cable because that's really a, a critical thing that people do need to have. Food, um, this is something that people forget to budget for. Uh, make sure that you budget for food and groceries and you're eating out and be realistic. Make sure you're budgeting enough for those things. Transportation, if you if you do have transportation costs, potentially this is public transportation or it's a vehicle or it's just Uber, but build those things in. And then clothing. This is also something that people kind of generally say, oh, this, I'm just gonna buy what I need when I, when I need it. But let's make sure that you have um, kind of a, a cushion built up, your own allocated bucket for clothing expense. Now it's great because um, clothes, cl clothing is so much more relaxed since we've, um, you know, all been virtual. Who is finding they're spending less money on clothes? Who's finding they're spending more money on clothes? I, I found that I am spending less money on professional clothes and more money on things like comfortable shoes um, or uh, things that I can use to get out um, and exercise. Like I, I am burning through my running shoes, you guys. <laughs> I feel like I'm buying them so much more frequently than I was before. But just make sure you have a budget for those. And then extras next. So your coffee, your tech, 
there, there might always be an opportunity to wait on that new tech item or you guys might disagree with me on that. Maybe, maybe tech is a necessity um, for you all and, and you prioritize it and that's okay. Just make sure that you have the budget uh, to cover that. Any questions about the basics of budgeting before we move on to everyone's favorite topic, which is credit scores? Okay. So I think the most important thing about a credit score is there's so much uncertainty around what goes into it. Why is my score higher or lower than someone else's? How do I boost my score? What does it all really mean? So if you have any specific questions about credit scores, go ahead and pop them in the chat and I will make sure to cover those. So there are three primary things um, that uh, are measured by your credit. And, and when I say this, I don't mean that it's measured um, by, the, by the general public. It's really measured by anyone you're looking to engage in a financial transaction with. So you're looking to borrow money or you're looking to maybe get car insurance, those types of things. So they um, really use a credit score um, to gauge these three things. One would be your character. How well are you managing and honoring your financial obligations? If you're borrowing $1,000, are you paying it back on time? Are you paying it back at all? Um, your capacity. So this looks really at your income um, in relation to your overall debt load. How have you been able to prove to manage your debt load that you already have now? Um, and primarily, this looks at your credit cards and lines of credit. So what percentage of your credit cards or lines of credit are you utilizing? Generally, you wanna be utilizing um, anywhere between 20 and 30% of any credit line at any, any given time. And this looks at uh, a cumulative total of all the credit card limits that you have. So if you've got um, three different credit cards that have a total of $10,000, you really probably wanna carry no more than $3,000 total between those three cards. And then also would be um, collateral. Is the loan that you are getting secured by something like a car or a home? Any questions here? Just make sure any questions, you pop them in the chat box. So I would like you guys to answer with an emoji this question. Um, so how well do you understand your credit score? If you're completely green, go ahead and throw the gloves in. If you think you've got some basic knowledge, um, the graduation cap, if you're solid, the, the guy with the smiley face and the teeth, um, or if you know you're an expert, pop the brain emoji in. All right, so we've got some basic knowledge, completely green, solid. Anybody else? All right. So I, I would agree. I think most people who fall in um, the basic knowledge um, to completely green, it's, it's something that I think a lot of people want to know what their credit score is um, because it's, it's good, right? You want to have a good credit score. Who doesn't want a good credit score? Because that's what we've been taught. But what does it all really mean? So what's really in your credit score? Um, and what is it really measuring? So it's really measuring for a lender what the forecast is that you will repay your loan as agreed during the next 24 months. Um, and the higher the score, the better the forecast you will repay. The higher the score that you have means the lower risk you are to a lender 
to lend to give you a credit card or to lend you twenty thousand dollars to buy a car or three or four or five hundred thousand dollars for a mortgage it really measures your risk the lower risk that you are the lower your credit score which means that your monthly payment is going to be lower um, than someone who has a worse credit score than you because they will have a higher rate. So what's in a credit score is really, it's just a snapshot of a very particular point in time. Um, when we're talking about credit scores today, I'm primarily focusing on the FICO model. The Vantage model is a newer model and there are a couple different versions. Um, so I'll get into that in a little bit, in a little bit more detail lately, but the FICO score is the longest running model that's being used by financial institutions today. Some of them are using the new Vantage score, um, but we'll focus again on FICO today. It looks at a very specific moment in time. So depending on where it's looking at, the mo at that moment in time, if you paid your credit card off yesterday, it's probably not reflected in your credit score today. Um, if you, you know, paid off a debt or a collection a couple weeks ago, that if that creditor hasn't updated their reporting to the credit bureaus yet, it's not updating. One of the things that's important to know about a credit score is that um, data in is data out. So if your provider is not reporting to the credit bureau, it's not impacting your score negatively or positively. Um, so if you're looking, if you are reviewing your credit report and something doesn't look right, you really need to contact your lender um, or the, the, your provider. So um, collections specifically are notorious for this, especially medical collections. They'll get placed on your credit report, but they won't report that they've been paid. Most um, financial institutions and lenders report at least once a month when the statement cycles. So what this means is that when they generate that bill to you to pay your credit card, typically what they will report is the amount on that bill. They'll report the balance on the bill and the payment due. So if you had a zero balance the entire month until a couple of days before they, they generated that bill um, and that statement, it doesn't matter. They're going to report the $2,000 balance that might be on the bill. So it's, it, the credit score is by no means a perfect, a perfect thing. And this is also why it is always changing. And it is only, only your, the things that you have are going to be impacted, um, are gonna be reflected on your credit score. If you have a partner and they have a loan that you're not on, you won't benefit from their positive payment history or their negative payment history. Any questions so far? Feel free to jump in anytime. Things that go into credit score. Again, this is focused on FICO, um, and I'll give you resources for Vantage and FICO here at the end. So payment history is the biggest percentage. If you do nothing else, make sure you pay all of your bills on time. That's the biggest impact to your credit score, and that's the thing that can swing it the most um, the, the most positively or negatively. And then the second factor is the amount owed. This is what I was talking about earlier in terms of the amount that you have borrowed against your limit on your credit report or your line of credit. I have seen um, credit scores swing up to 150 points uh, for members and um, for folks that I have worked with in the past that have maybe owed $20,000 on a $25,000 credit card, and then they've been able to pay that off. And a month or so later, when their bill cycles again with a zero balance, their credit score is up 100 to 120 points. This is, this is the thing about a credit score is that it's, it's not a perfect picture, but things like that can be very impactful to the scoring. The other percentage um, is the length of credit history. So if we put um, two consumers side by side and one of them had been um, borrowing for five years and one of them had been borrowing for 10 years, if they have the exact same accounts, the person who's been borrowing for 10 years 
is the one who will have the higher score just because they've had a longer length of credit history. Um, and then new credit, if you um, are opening too many new credit lines at a time, this can appear to the credit scoring model that you're in over your head potentially and don't, um, and, and you're living beyond your means. So try to me, the, the rule of thumb is probably to not open any more than two items, two new items a year. If you can keep it to less, that would be a good idea. And then the last factor is the types of credit used. We could have two borrowers and one has a mortgage and an auto loan and the other one has all credit cards. The borrower with the mortgage and the auto loans are, is going to have a higher credit score because those are installment loans with, a, with collateral versus someone who only has credit cards. Um, too much credit card debt is usually a signal um, to the lender and then also to the FICO model that you're living beyond your means. So for Jenny's question is for credit cards, does it matter if you pay the whole balance off each month or just the minimum payment? So if you are just paying the minimum payment as long as you're paying on time, this is, this is great. Um, if you're paying the full balance off and not building it back up, um, your score will be higher. If you're paying the full balance back up off and building it back up to the same amount that it would have been if you'd been making the minimum payment, the score will not um, be impacted by one or, it, it won't be impacted differently by one of those two actions because FICO is not looking at where you are at any given point throughout the month. So this is um, one of the primary differences between the FICO score and the Vantage score. The Vantage score is actually looking at what your behavior is doing throughout the month and how much you're paying. It's reporting that um, and factoring that in. So I, while we're focusing on FICO today, I actually think that the Vantage score is probably the direction that um, the majority of lenders will be moving in the future because it gives a better financial picture. But since we're not there yet, we're gonna focus on the FICO model for the purposes of this presentation since that, that's where lenders are going. Um, that's, where, that's where lenders are in the moment. Um, but, but Vantage, I think, is the direction that the majority of lenders will end up. Let's see. So a good credit score range for students, and how do you know if you're ready for a credit card? I will come back to those questions. So um, credit score ranges. Really, if you're a student, I think you're in good shape if you're a 680 or above. You're not going to get the best rate. Um, most people, when you're starting to build your credit, what I typically see is somewhere between a 680 and a 720 credit score, as long as you're paying things on time and you're not carrying too much debt. What I mean by not carrying too much debt is what I see happening a lot is a student will get a thousand dollar credit card and use all of it. So they'll use all thousand dollars and their credit score will be about a 680. But if they're not using all of it, their credit score will be higher, about a 720. If you can try to target um, anywhere in that 700 to 740 range, that, that's really pretty solid as far as FICO goes. Vantage is moving, is moving up um, a little bit. Those guys with Vantage, you probably need to be closer to a 720, 760 range. Um, Rishi, does that answer your question? Hopefully. I would say that even if you only have one, um, one credit card and you're not maxing it out each month, or, or you have student loans and you're paying them, your score is probably higher than that. Your score is probably solidly in the 700s somewhere, as long as you don't have any, anything else going on. Um, how do you know you are ready to get a credit card? So if a credit card is a really great way to start to establish your credit history. That's where most students start. There are a couple options for doing this. One would be to just apply um, for a credit card. You do have to be able to prove that you have income. The credit, card of 2009, the credit Card Act of 2009 said that financial institutions cannot target students for, um, who are under 21 
for credit cards and that if they they apply for a credit card and you are under 21 you have to be able to pr prove that you have income to support the credit card or you have to have a cosigner so you're ready for a credit card if you have the income to support it or if you have someone who's willing to cosign for you to help establish credit history the other option is a secured credit card so in this case you might have a thousand dollars that you deposit in a savings account with the financial institution and they give you um, a credit card with a thousand dollar limit cherish let me know if that answers your question about knowing if you're ready Let's see which credit card should we take discover amex or any other I generally like to suggest that you start with any um, provider that um, offers one of the major brands, which would be Visa, Discover, American Express, um, or MasterCard. Typically, Visa and MasterCard are um, the primary brands in, in the credit card market. So even, um, but, but there's nothing wrong with a Discover and Amex. You'll just find that they're not accepted as many places on uh, especially online but when you're evaluating a credit card offer you really need to look at what their rate and fee structure looks like all of them are required to provide a loan solicitation and disclosure which will show you what um, your rate will be what your penalty rate will be if you don't pay on time if there's an annual fee and what the late fee will be so I can't really answer that question specifically. You'll just need to look at the different uh, offers that are available in your market. If you've got good credit, I would start with um, just doing a search to see where rates are or start with your a local financial institution or credit union. Credit unions do typically have really great rates on their cards and many times they are non-variable. So they won't change um, as the prime rate moves. If you are using that full thousand dollars but are paying it off every month, does that build your score faster or slower? Um, Zach, your score, um, if, you're, if we're looking at the FICO model, it's going to show every month that you're maxed out and your score is not going to build. If they're using the Vantage model, it's possible that the score will improve, but you really need to keep no more than 25 to 30 percent on it. If you find that you're hitting the thousand dollars every month, then you, I would suggest if you, if you can afford it, that you request a credit limit increase. Um, or if you're maxing it out with the intention of building your credit, it's, it's really doing the opposite. Let's see. When is the best time to switch to a second credit card? So I would say that the, you, if you're going to start um, adding additional lines of credit or additional trade lines or um, debts, you wait at least 12 months to do that after you open your first one. And the key here is you're not actually switching, you're just adding um, additional lines because you don't wanna wipe out your payment history on that first card. If you open a second card and then close the first one, it's gonna wipe out all that good payment history on the first one. And you won't be starting from scratch completely, but it's not going to maintain a high um, credit score for you. And you also want to have multiple cards open in some scenarios so that you build up that limit, that total limit amount. So if your first card had a $1,000 limit and your second card has a, a $2,000 limit, your total limit available is $3,000. So if you use 500 to 1,000 on one of those cards, you're only using 30% of um, the capacity on those cards. So you're only using 1,000 out of 3,000 versus if you were to close that first card, you'd be using 1,000 out of 2,000. So don't, that, don't close cards if you're not using them unless you've got plenty of other options and, um, and if that card has annual fees for some reason. Okay. As a member of a credit union, what's something 
credit unions look at other than credit scores that um, impact the payments or is only based on credit scores. So when a lender is looking, any lender is looking to approve um, a loan or a credit card, they primarily look at four things. One is credit score. Um, and when they look at the credit score, they also look at your credit history. So they look at how long you've had other um, credit cards and loans open. They look at how, they look on the credit report to see how well you've paid those things in the past. If you've got any outstanding collections um, or anything else that looks odd on your credit report. So that could be that you've applied 10 different places in the last week, potentially. That's a, that's a red flag. So the first, the one big bucket they're looking at is credit overall um, that includes all those things I just mentioned. The second is ability to repay. And what falls into those buckets are your debt to income. So what is your total unsecured debt ratio in relation to your total annual income? We want that to be under 25%. So if you have $25,000 in credit card debt, you need to be making at least $100,000 a year. Um, we also look, now every lender is a little bit different. The ratios are a little different for every lender. And also they look a little bit differently at if the loan you're asking for is an unsecured loan like a credit card or if it's a secured loan like a car loan. So the second ratio that we look at is your total monthly obligations in relation to your total monthly gross income. So we'll take a sum of your monthly expenses for rent, any, any items that show up on your credit report, like um, payments to a car loan or a credit card or a student loan or any of those things, and that needs to be a certain percentage of your monthly income. So I hope I answered your question. There are multiple things that will go into the approval, but I think you asked me about the payment. So the payment, the rate impacts the payment, um, but also some credit cards will require a different payment percentage of the balance. So some credit card providers say that you need a minimum payment of five to 10% of your balance, and others are three, um, some are 1% of the balance, we, um, so we did used to require 3% of your balance as your minimum payment, and we have changed that to 1.5% probably five years ago. Let's see. Should we use our credit card details for direct deposit? Uh, let me, I, I'd like to clarify that question. Are you referring to a direct deposit payroll or are you referring to using a credit card to make payments on bills? So I would not you, you I don't think that there's a way to use a credit card for direct deposit because it's just going to overpay um, it's just going to overpay that card and it's not that's not going to work that a lot of lenders won't allow that so you could use a debit card though to link it to your checking account that might be what you're thinking of possibly um, typically for payroll direct deposit you're going to provide your maker number and um, which is the account number associated with the savings or checking account and then also the routing number for that financial institution I'm not sure if I answered your question completely, so throw extra questions in there if we, if we need to. I'm gonna keep rolling because we only have 12 minutes left. These are all good questions. Um, and I can stay on later for anyone who does have additional questions. So we talked a little bit about um, saving money on loans with based on credit score. So here's just a quick example of a borrower who um, has an A plus credit score, an A credit score. So for us, we consider that over a 700 credit score. They're going to get a 299 rate on their auto loan versus somebody who has a 640 credit score. They're going to end up at almost 11%. Um, so that's a savings of almost $8,000 a 
over the term of that loan. I'm also gonna cover really quickly what's on your credit report. So things that show up on your credit report are your name, your current and previous addresses, um, an employer and date of birth. This is one other thing that lenders look at is how long you've been employed at a specific employer because uh, folks tend to move around um, with their employ with specific employers more than they used to, but stay in the, in the same field. Um, we look more at time in that line of work instead of with that specific employer now. Um, other information that will show up is the amount of the credit that's been granted to you. So those lines of credit like car loans, mortgages, student loans, and credit cards, your timeliness of repayment, um, and then potentially your payment patterns for the last seven years. Things do start to drop off your credit report after seven years. And then this is a big one, public record information. Um, if you've ever filed, I'm, I'm doubting that um, this is that a lot of this group has, but you may, you probably know someone who has filed bankruptcy. Um, that's going to show up on your credit report for at least seven years, collection accounts. Um, if you've attended the U of I and you ever had to go to the doctor here, make sure that you are checking your credit report for medical collections. Um, this, this is a common challenge that students have because they move, you guys move around um, or you have a different place that you live each year. Sometimes those bills don't end up with you and you don't know that you might owe $25 or $50 for that doctor's visit. So th that's something that you need to keep in mind is those collection accounts. Um, and then also overdue child support and tax liens do show up sometimes. That's, that's no longer um, reporting. I've got a couple of resources. Yes, Amy, let me throw those um, up here. I'm gonna skip the do's and don'ts. So here's a couple things. Um, these are the, these are the uh, web addresses for the three credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Um, today, I'd like you all to go out to annualcreditreport.com and pick one of these guys and pull a copy of it and just check to make sure that everything that's showing up on your credit report is, is actually yours and factual. Um, so a good step is to do, to visit annualcreditreport.com um, three times a year, every four months, and pull a credit bureau from each, each one, a different one each time, because you're entitled to one free copy annually from each of those credit bureaus. Um, and just make sure that there's nothing there that's not yours, and you can dispute anything that is not yours right there from that credit report. So I talked a lot about FICO, that's the um, more traditional credit scoring model. You can find a lot of information on myfico.com. Um, and then Vantage is the newer scoring model that all three credit bureaus um, have developed together. And that site is yourvantagescore.com. Uh, there are quite a few credit reporting options out there tied to credit cards and um, to your financial institution. So if you've got an account that's displaying um, your credit score, take a look and see what model they're using and then go out to these sites and find out the details about what's going into your score. Um, there are a couple different Vantage models. There's 3.0 and 4.0 in the original. I skipped around quite a bit um, here at the end. So since we do have a couple minutes, I'm gonna pop um, back over here so everyone can have a chance to see the do's and don'ts of maintaining a good credit score. So make sure you're paying your bills on time. Keep your balance low in relation to your available credit. Monitor your credit report. Have a good mix of loans. Um, you can talk to me if you have questions about your credit score once you pull it. Um, I'm happy to help you review that. Um, make sure you don't open any accounts that you're not going to use and don't close any unused accounts that are good standing. Well, this is one I have I did not cover yet. Make sure you don't ask to re decrease your credit limit on current cards. Remember the total amount that you have available um, plays a critical factor in your score. Um, I made that mistake once I asked um, a card to decrease down to a $500 limit, but I'd spent a lot more than that at one point. Um, and don't open um, a 
number of new accounts in a short time. Shelby, you can check your credit score. Um, as long as you're doing soft hits, it really won't lower your score. And if it does, we're talking about a couple points, which is really insignificant. Um, but if you're applying for a lot of loans, that will lower your credit score because they're doing a hard pool on your credit. Um, for, for example, an insurance company will do a soft hit, but an auto lender will um, do a hard hit. That, uh, that's interesting. If you're shopping for a car, they, um, if you walk into a dealership and you ask them to help you get the loan, they're going to send your application to anywhere between five and 15 lenders, and they're gonna pull your credit five to 15 times at each of those lenders. So um, just be careful with things like that. But if you're planning to close that loan with them right away, it, it should be able to, your score should be able to recover before you need to buy something else or apply for another, another credit. There are so many things related to credit um, and very specific based on each individual's situation in terms of their credit mix and the length of their credit and all of those things. So if you have any questions, again, just pop them in the chat. Um, Annie and Jenny have my contact information that they can share with you if you have additional questions. Again, I'm happy to look at your um, credit report with you. I would encourage you all to go ahead and visit annualcreditreport.com. Um, it won't deliver the score to you for free, but it will deliver the credit report, which is really what you want. You want to make sure there's nothing on there that doesn't belong to you, especially if you are a junior, um, if your parent has the same name as you, or if there's someone living in this, the, your same, at your same address with the same name, sometimes um, things start to get, start to get mixed up. Less, less so now um, than they did before everything was digital, but it, it does still happen from time to time. Any other questions? All right. Jenny, Annie, thank you all yes, for joining Thank you so today. much, Kate. Yes, that was great, um, as always. So every, every summer, this is one of our most popular and <laughs> most, most asked for workshop. So really, really appreciate all of the, the great advice.